Welcome to this statewide issues forum. I'm Ellen Hannock. I'm the director of the Water Policy Center at the Public Policy Institute of California. And I have this star cast of state leaders um, with me here and the, the honor of moderating this panel to kind of talk about what's going on in, in the Delta and the, and the, the Delta watershed and um, hopefully come away with not just challenges but also some some, some hopeful messages about, about where we're going. Um, I'm first introduce, I, I think probably they don't need any introduction, but I'm gonna give you a brief introduction of, of, of the panelists, and then um, we'll get into some conversation. So to my immediate, I was, yeah, which is this? To my immediate left, <laughs> you're right, um, is Didi Dadamo, who is vice chair of the State Water Board and has, been there since 2013, is that right? 20, 2013. 2013, um, and, and is the ag member, in addition to being the, the vice chair from the Central Valley. Then we have Carlin Nemeth, who has been director of the Department of Water Resources since January of 2018, but um, was hanging out in the resources agency for pretty much the, the entire Brown administration, I think. Um, so the, the Delta has been uh, a friend of hers <laughs> for, for a very long time and a busy, important part of her, her working day and probably her dreams at night. Um, and <laughs> Susan Tatoyan, who is the chair of the Delta Stewardship Council. Susan joined the council in, I think, uh, 2014, is yes. that right? And became chair this year, this year right. we're serving previously as vice chair. Um, and so we have three state leaders who, all of whom, if, in, in Susan's case, the Delta is, is her entire job. For Didi and for Carla, it's not their entire jobs, but I'm sure that on many, many, many days, it feels like your entire job. Um, and there's a lot going on. Um, this is a longstanding uh, issue area for, for California, and I think the, the program described it as sort of one of the the greatest, if not the, the greatest challenge that, that California water has. Um, big issues in balancing water supplies for, for people um, with the needs of a rich and diverse um, native ecosystem that's in a lot of trouble. Um, there are other issues that that um, both uh, Susan and Carla deal with on the, on the flood management side of things too, very, very an area of great flood risk. And um, when we think about the Delta, sometimes we just are, have conversations that tend to focus on the export side of things, the fact that water is pulled through the Delta to the pumps in the south, and that is a very important part of our infrastructure and serves, I think the stats are about two, th at least water for at least part of the water for about two thirds of the population and several million acres of farmland. But if you think about the watershed as a whole, which is really where we're having big policy discussions right now, we're looking at more like 90% of the state's population and I think about six million acres of farmland that are served from upstream diversions, both in the Sac Valley and the San Joaquin River area, as well as in the Bay Area. So, big deal. Um, lots going on. We are about a year out now from a big decision that the state board made on sort of beginnings of, of the water quality control plan update for the Bay Delta. Uh, and that has launched, the, well, that, that sort of, I'm gonna let Didi talk about it a little bit more, but, but kind of a, a process of voluntary agreements that folks have been working on, hard at work on since then coming up on a deadline, I think. Um, meanwhile, there are endangered, so that's water quality law. There are endangered species laws, both at the federal and the state, uh, in the federal and state laws that are important for how we manage water, and there's been a lot of action on, on that recently. Um, the Delta Plan is just through five, five years now and, and in, the, in the process of, um, you know, sort of implementation and with some recent updates. Um, and, and all of these are aimed at sort of thinking about 
how we balance the, the various needs in the, in the system. And um, so I, I think we're going to start with just some updates on where we are in, in some of these regulatory processes right now, um, and, and then we'll, we'll get into some, some other details a after that. So maybe, Didi, let's, let's start with you and just hear a little bit what's going on where with the Water are. Quality Control Plan. Great. So uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Um, uh, in uh, 2018, Ellen, you alluded to an action that our board took in 2018. So um, that was uh, to adopt phase one, which is re regarding the San Joaquin um, and its tributaries um, for the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan. This is a massive undertaking the law, the Federal Clean Water Act, requires that we update the plan every three years. The plan had a review in 2006, and at that point, uh, the board, I wasn't on the board at the time, but the board uh, called out that it was important to do um, a, a very significant review and a plan update in the next round to address the collapse of the species in the Delta. And so the board had been um, uh, had already directed staff quite some time ago, but it's a very it's a significant um, project, and so it was uh, placed into two phases: phase one on the San Joaquin, phase two on the Sacramento uh, watershed and its tributaries. And when we acted in uh, 2018, um, it was not without a significant amount of conflict. Um, I came to the board uh, really in large part because I wanted to, I felt that I could contribute um, to the development of the plan, really excited about the board's, board's role to balance all beneficial uses. Um, but I, I have to say, and our, uh, um, our attorneys have been telling us that uh, the lever that we have to address these issues is a flow lever. Uh, there's a lot of talk about other approaches, but we did not have that before us in 2018 when we acted. Um, uh, fortunately, uh, there was um, one group, there was quite a bit of discussion before we adopted our plan to have a different approach, an approach uh, that would be more comprehensive and take into account not just flow, but habitat, uh, additional science, um, and uh, governance, um, looking at the, the watershed as a whole. Um, we, we did have one group that came to us on the Tuolumne, uh, the city, of San, city and county of San Francisco, Modesto and Merced, or Modesto and Turlock irrigation districts. And so they presented a uh, voluntary approach uh, that could, um, it, that included flow and some of these non-flow measures. And then a large uh, number of um, water districts um, on the Sacramento decided that even though they weren't before us at that time, this was just on the San Joaquin, they reached out to, and I'll let Carla talk more about this, but they reached out to the resources agency and kind of did a, a, a jump start on a package, uh, a conceptual package on voluntary agreements. And so when we adopted the plan, um, even though um, it was not without controversy, it was um, a moment for, I think, a vision and hope uh, to um, begin the process for this more comprehensive voluntary agreement package um, and a commitment to undertake serious discussions um, in the following year. And so that would be this year. And um, I've been... Um, uh, very hopeful, sometimes not so hopeful. Um, I'm not in the trenches, though. I know that uh, Director Nemeth is, and so I'll let her talk a little bit more about that. But just will say that we have our staff very much involved in the state team working um, and providing technical assistance um, as they are developing these agreements. Thanks. So that's a perfect segue for you, Charla. Okay. So. Um, Thank you for having me. Um, it's a delight to be here with uh, my fellow panelists and you, Ellen, and I see a lot of people that um, I've been working with pretty diligently for a while now in the audience. So um, this is a great opportunity um, for me to reflect and assess where we are. Um, I want to add a little bit to the historical picture that Dee Dee laid out and the Water Board's traditional role with the Water Quality Control Plan and um, where we were as a state in 2006. And um, 
I, um, I actually uh, predate the Brown administration on Delta issues and started in the Schwarzenegger era with um, what was called the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. And um, setting aside Delta conveyance as part of that for a moment, um, from an ecosystem perspective, we are dealing with the exact same things, or we were dealing with the exact same things then as, as we are trying to really grapple through now, um, but with some important, uh, uh, important improvements. And one of those improvements is really uh, focusing on landscape scale uh, approaches to ecosystem restoration, which is essential, in my view, to achieving the success that we need to have at an ecosystem level that can enable uh, water users in the state to have more reliable water supplies. Um, but what happened in the brown years, meaning the big drought, um, was also a game changer in many ways. And now uh, what it's really brought to the fore is the intensity of drought, um, the challenges that species face during um, drought and dry periods, and the reality that you know, when we have, when that drought is followed by a big boom, a, a big wet water year, the system itself isn't behaving or responding as we once thought it would. And so those are challenges, I think, that have emerged significantly in the last two to three years and are front and center in terms of, you know, how we grapple with um, the changes we need to make um, in the context of managing the Delta and its watershed as a whole and using the voluntary agreements as an important vehicle to do so. Um, so uh, for folks who are not familiar with it, uh, the voluntary agreements essentially encompass 10 tributaries to the Delta. And what we are, are working on is a uh, set of actions that could be implemented over the next 15 years, uh, both uh, new environmental flows and physical restoration from up in the upper watershed down to the delta. And, uh, and, and doing that such that we can improve conditions in, uh, in the delta and its tributaries for species. And it's different from the way we've tried things in the past. One is the regulatory regime just generally. So it's much broader than, um, than uh, you mentioned the federal and state endangered species acts where you're really focused on avoiding harm and, and, and mitigating. This is really about um, uh, beneficial uses, all balancing across all beneficial uses in the Delta, but actually improving conditions. And, um, and that gives us, um, in my view, a lot more room to try things that we have not had the collective political will to try in California. And one is uh, embracing the fact that we've got a lot of good ideas, but we have far fewer answers. And so, the voluntary agreements, what, what will really make them go is the governance and science and adaptive management structure that comes with it, whereby uh, the, the entities that are participating, the water users participating, together with environmental groups who are participating, are working with state and federal agencies um, to plan sort of year in, year out, the physical restoration that needs to happen in the watersheds and down in the delta, and, and testing uh, with water for the environment how we can activate that uh, restoration and generate important uh, features for fish, be it food supply or rearing habitat or other, uh, other things that we know fish need to become more resilient. Um, we are also very focused on um, trying to sort out the importance of improvements in these drier water year types. Um, and that is something I think that the drought uh, that really drove that point home where um, by and large, I think in California, um, most of our economy and communities fared very well in the drought. And you can see that folks had made uh, a lot of important local investments that could um, help protect communities uh, in, in 
the depths of a drought. But rural communities very much suffered in the drought and our environment very much suffered in the drought. So one of our objectives in the course of these voluntary agreements is to be able to demonstrate um, an, an ability to improve the resilience of the environment to survive in these drought, drier or drought periods that we know are absolutely coming. Um, we have a few general principles, a few of them I touched on already. One, landscape scale. Um, two, uh, working through both uh, flows and physical habitat. Three, science and adaptive management and a known governance structure that, that can help us. Um, but four, it's also, you know, everybody, everybody's in for something. We've all struggled with a classic tragedy of the commons in the Delta. And to me, what's most exciting about the effort underway is the number of participants around the table that are putting resources on the table, that are uh, working uh, with other water agency partners, uh, environmental partners, to, uh, to establish a program that we think is going to be acceptable uh, when we bring it to the water board. Um, I was uh, very enmeshed in it with the previous administration um, and, and certainly very enmeshed in it uh, now with uh, the secretaries of Cal EPA and Natural Resources Agency. And I think um, they've, they've made a couple of um, very important process improvements. Um, one which uh, Didi touched on is a lot more integration between our department, uh, water resources, uh, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation is a really significant partner in the effort as well, but all working with the water board uh, staff to uh, help understand uh, what's put on the table and um, what, we, what we can expect it to do and how to make improvements. And um, that is no small feat. Um, we, ha as I mentioned, we have 10 different tributaries. People have their different models and different on the ground experiences in those tributaries. And there's a lot of information to pull together and synthesize. And that has never been done before. I'm getting a sense of why that hasn't been done before. <laughs> but the reality is, um, you know, I think we have a few optimists around the table, but, but you know, uh, necessity is the mother of all invention, right? And so I think most people understand that uh, to do nothing or to revert back to our old ways of doing business, uh, which is by the very definition is piecemeal and not ultimately going to do what we need it to do to face the challenges uh, of the future. Um, so that's, that's my take on the voluntary agreements. Um, and uh, we have more work to do um, heading into the beginning part of next year. Um, and uh, I look forward to that. And uh, I also want to thank everybody in this room who's been uh, participating in that process right along with me. Uh, thank you for, for your willingness to roll up your sleeves and, and start crafting some solutions. Thank you. So S Susan. Um, your, the, the Delta Stewardship Council does a lot of things. One of the key things is really try to have an integrated approach to science. And I think, you know, with a, a really stellar science plan and some great progress in, in trying to bring folks together on this. And, I, and I, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about sort of the role that you see for for science in in solutions to to the delta and kind of progress progress to date and what needs to still happen. Sure, thanks, Ellen. Um, let me start though by for those of you who aren't familiar with the Delta Stewardship Council, we're the agency tasked with developing and implementing the long-term management plan for the delta, and. Um, the Delta Plan is unusual in that it has policies that, that are regulatory through um, what's called the covered actions process, and it's a certification process. And project proponents um, self-certify whether or not they are consistent with the Delta Plan. Uh, and if you have any questions about the details of the Delta Plan, I'd, I'd be happy to go into that. But to, to get to Ellen's point, I am really excited about where we are in 
trying to manage water through the delta. The delta is a keystone to water deliveries to uh, areas in Southern California, Bay Area, San Joaquin Valley. And with the advent, advent of uh, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and the concepts of um, managed aquifer recharge and voluntary agreements and the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan, I think that we are um, in gaining momentum in flexibility and integration. Um, there are some things we need, like improved infrastructure uh, and, and different approaches to governance. And so the role of science in this more adaptive approach to managing ecosystems in water is, is, is fundamental and necessary. The, the Delta Stewardship Council um, has a science program, and we also have uh, an independent science board, and the board is independent of the council. Um, and the independent science board and the science program help us achieve what is mandated by law. The law requires that best available science be used in managing the delta and making informed decisions about the delta. And so to give you an example, um, when Carla speaks about uh, governance of science and science on at least six tributaries to the two major rivers that flow into the delta, that's a huge undertaking. And, and she mentioned that you know, not much um, synthesis of the scientific data has been done, and there is a reason for that. There's, there's, um, there are a few barriers, including funding and including governance structures. Um, so I'm excited to tell you about a, an effort that, that was approved by, by what's called DPIC. And DPIC also is mandated by the Delta Reform Act of 2009. It, it, it comprises leaders from 18 federal and state agencies, and the Water Board and DWR are, are members of DPIC. And the whole purpose of DPIC is to get these agencies together, US EPA, US Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA Fisheries, De California Department of Fish and Wildlife Service, Army Corps of Engineers, uh, USGS, um, DWR, the Water Board, Cal EPA, and we meet twice a year, we're hoping to meet more often, to, to coordinate our efforts and update each other and, and um, do a better job of long-term governance of management of the Delta. And DPIC approved a science funding and governance work group um, last year, and that work group has come up with um, recommendations for um, helping to improve the l synthesis and, and scientific research. And, and right now, where that funding and governance work group is, is it's, DPIC has approved the work group to go forward on three priority actions. And, and the first action is to take a good hard look at how we're spending money. And by we, I mean the collective DPIC community. How are the agencies, federal, state, and local, spending money on science? What kind of science is it spent on? About 80% of the funding right now goes to science that's devoted to meeting legal requirements. So not much money is going to forward-looking science and research that could, could better inform uh, management decisions, decisions in the Delta. So there's the, the more effective and efficient use of funding. The, the, the second priority action that DPIC approved is um, prioritizing. So once we have a better handle on the different scientific components and, and the funding, what are the management actions that we want these um, scientific endeavors to answer? So for example, the question of how much flow and how much habitat in uh, the voluntary agreements. 
Um, that's a huge question. And, and as Carla said, a lot of synthesis and, and, and forward-looking research needs to happen. A lot of, and I'm, I'm imagining that as we go deeper into what science do we want to inform things like voluntary agreements and, and Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan, we'll discover that we will need more science. So reliable funding of the science is, is crucial. The, the third priority action uh, is to look beyond the regulatory and look beyond the status and trend science and start looking at, given climate change, um, we really do need to accelerate uh, our scientific endeavors so that we can better, be better prepared for the unimagined. Um, not much money is going to forward-looking science quite yet. So a workshop, uh, the Stewardship Council and, and the Independent Science Board and others are convening a workshop on April 27 to 29 next year um, in, at UC Davis to start to, to define the questions uh, about what kind of forward-looking science will we need to better integrate and, and better um, manage in a, an adaptive manner. Um, but I can't emphasize enough that whether you're talking about the biological opinions or the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan or voluntary agreements or um, the water resilience portfolio that the governor called for, I think where we are all wanting to go is, is a, a much more nimble and flexible and, a, and adaptive um, dynamic management of these uh, water systems. Um, and the delta will be the grand challenge <laughs> of flexibility and integration and, and science governance. So maybe turn to the two of you also, and cause science obviously is a, a key issue for the board in your, enabling you to decide, yes, you can accept a voluntary agreement or no, you can't. Um, and Carly, you mentioned as well just the, the importance of being able to kind of adapt and learn as we go. Um, what are your what do you see as some of the key things that need to happen on, on, the, on the science front, whether it's uh, particular kinds of research or ki ways we organize or ways we fund uh, that, that will be key to, to going forward? Well, I'll just start by saying this is an area that um, I think we all crave more science. And uh, one of the great things about the voluntary agreements is that it's an opportunity for us to um, maybe not get all the answers, but you know, part of this is going to be an experiment and including adaptive management and a structure, as Carla said, it'll include governance and a structure uh, to be able to um, incorporate that science into um, changes um, in, in flow, habitat, you know, whatever the package is. Um, ultimately, though, whatever we get, I know that the team, the, the state team that's working on the voluntary agreements um, is putting together a way for us as a board to evaluate those uh, voluntary agreements. And so uh, they've got models that they're using and not just one. Uh, our board, um, our staff just released um, a model, but there are other models that I know the department has access to and then um, additionally some way uh, to better evaluate um, in an increase in habitat and um, the ability maybe to provide for less flow and um, what that might result in. Um, one of the key components of these voluntary agreements is the establishment of biological environmental targets. And so the idea would be um, to, that this package um, would get us in the direction to be able to um, meet those targets. Whatever we receive as a board though, um, our staff would be evaluating it, it would go into the CEQA document, and it would be um, an alternative that we as a board could consider, and it would need to have you know, underpinnings in science. So it all gets back to, it's not only what we need to go forward for the future decision making, but also the decision itself. 
Um, and, and one thing that I uh, failed to say in my earlier comments um, uh, in terms of the, the traditional approach of adoption of a Bay Delta plan uh, uh, that we have as opposed to voluntary agreements. We already talked about uh, a comprehensive package you know, of flow, non-flow measures, science, but there's a, an added advantage and that's time. So under a traditional approach, um, uh, this is a plan, it's not self-implementing. We would have to go through an additional f phase of implementation uh, most likely through um, water rights um, uh, proceedings, uh, possibly through a regulation. Both of those um, uh, avenues uh, would take quite some time to accomplish and would be fraught with litigation. And so for us to undergo a traditional approach, it might be you know, as much as a decade or more before we would actually see some of the benefits from uh, the water quality control plan adopted under a traditional approach. I think that what the voluntary agreements are looking at, it could be as soon as uh, maybe a year. And so, um, it, it, and the species are declining, have been declining, so that's an added value, I think, in a voluntary, more con comprehensive approach. Do you want to add anything on? Sure, I, I would add, I think we have, um, we have better information on the tributaries about what we can anticipate in terms of a response. We have um, demonstrably less certain information um, in the Delta, and part of the challenge is we've been really slow on uh, doing the things I think we need to do in the Delta, uh, particularly when it comes to physical habitat. Um, we have, in the past two to three years, really accelerated. We've got some great new uh, habitat projects that are underway in the Delta. Um, but the reality is we, um, we know we need to do it, uh, but we don't have the information that uh, supports with precision. If you build X amount of habitat, you're gonna see Y amount of improvement. Uh, so we desperately need to get going on that. And I can't uh, emphasize enough what Dee Dee mentioned about the idea of um, getting ourselves in a space where we are willing to experiment. And, and what I mean by that is we're willing to try things that may not work, and we're willing to be open about what worked and what did not. Um, that's gonna require a lot more trust and orders of magnitude more transparency in terms of um, how the projects operate and how the systems operate when it comes to flow, but also uh, working with our partners on uh, the physical restoration and really understanding uh, and monitoring and designing future habitat projects to do even better. And uh, we are at a moment where we can either uh, submit to paralysis or we can take that uh, that leap of faith. Um, it's a leap of faith, but it's also uh, a leap with dollars. So that's not something I think anyone takes lightly. The voluntary agreements, we have a price tag of about, uh, I think our last cost estimate was about $1.9 billion for that 15 year period. Um, half of that uh, funding would come from the water agencies, the other half would come from public sources, so state and federal governments. Um, and, uh, and that's real money and real um, assets on the table to help us improve, uh, improve our system. So, VAs are a big thing on people's minds. It's not the only thing that's mm -hmm. happening right now. Um, you know, I'm trying to decide if I want to ask you first. Let, yeah, I'm going to ask you first, Carla, and then, okay. we'll, then we'll, we're going to talk about Sigma a little bit because it's all, it ties, it's very important for all this. But first, let's talk a little bit about the ESAs and mm -hmm. are, you guys, are you guys suing the feds? And if you are, is that going to help or hurt this process? So, what, whatever you so are this, able to tell us about so this. The state, is, <laughs> as the state administration has signaled its intent to mm -hmm. sue the federal administration on the biological opinions. Um, uh, the Department of Water Resources is pursuing a separate permit for the State Water Project under the California Endangered Species Act. And I want to kind of take a step back and sort of separate it a little bit from the um, 
uh, I guess, disagreements around the federal biological opinion. And just for clarity's sake, the Department of Water Resources, our federal permit is, are these federal biological opinions. And uh, the department had been participating as we always would in a permitting process for our own project. So I just want to get some clarity around that. Uh, but there are also differences in California Endangered Species Act and certain requirements of the law from the federal law. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, again, having been with the prior administration in, in different capacities, one of the things I think that was always under discussion be between the Department of Water Resources and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife is, uh, is uh, pursuing a separate permitting process for the state water project under, uh, under state law. And there were a bunch of reasons for that. So historically, the way that it's worked is, uh, we work through a federal process and uh, the Department of Water Resources would take our federal permit and give it to the Department of Fish and Wildlife and say, can you declare this consistent with state law? And um, that has um, certainly some real pros, especially around efficiency and making sure that we have good alignment uh, between the projects and how they operate. Um, but, uh, but one of the things that has, has been under discussion between the, do, the two departments for the last decade is um, the ability to um, adaptively manage under CESA and an ability to be more flexible about how we manage in the context of CESA if we pursue separate independent permits. Um, so in other words, we're not you know, working through the federal government to change a determination there and then change a determination for the Department of Fish and Wildlife to, uh, to operate the system uh, with, more flex with more flexibility or uh, with an eye for more adaptive management. I think the desire to do that has um, only increased in the past couple of years. So, um, so uh, DWR is currently in the process of uh, completing a, um, a permit application to the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, the department um, is very much um, focused on bringing new science into the process and is um, very much uh, focused on uh, real-time operations in ways that are very uh, similar in terms of how they appear in the federal opinion. Um, that's where we do our monitoring and we operate um, the state water project um, dependent on fish presence and other things so that we avoid uh, so that we avoid harming uh, threatened and endangered fish um, that is the wave of the future in terms of in, in my view in just terms of greater level of sophistication technology we're really going to need that given how our hydrology is changing in california to me no question that that that's part of it um, I would say, you know, by the same token, um, the department also understands that fresh water is part of the habitat mix in, in the delta, and how that, um, how that fits in the context of determinations that need to be made under California ESA is something that we're working on um, kind of as we speak. And, you know, that will be um, part of the overall puzzle. I think that informs, uh, that informs the bigger picture in the voluntary agreements and what we're able to do for fish. Um, in my mind, though, I, I think our, you know, uh, you know litigation um, notwithstanding, to me, what, what all of this demonstrates is, you know, the limitations of Federal Endangered Species Act and California Endangered Species Act in doing the things we need to do in the Delta. And there is none chance that when those laws were passed, they contemplated the complexity or the overwhelming challenge of climate and other pressures on the system. Um, and so I think we need to face that reality. Uh, and that's, you know, again, that's why for the Department of Water Resources, um, we just fundamentally think um, the, you know, the best way to get at these co-equal goals in the Delta is, you know, really through this voluntary agreement kind of, uh, kind of process and, and content. Thank you. 
Um, so now let's talk about the other tough thing, or one of the other tough things. Uh, let's talk about Sigma and how that fits in with all of this. Um, you know, both on the, on the Delta export side, mm -hmm. the San Joaquin Valley <coughs> is, you know, folks are getting ready to turn in their, their first um, groundwater sustainability plans. Uh, we estimate that the, the groundwater deficit or the, the, the excess pumping is, averages close to two million acre feet a year down there. And um, so the demand for water from the Delta is only going to be higher, um, not, you know, any, any additional cuts are going to make it that much tougher. But, but it's not just about exports, really. It's also about, you know, the whole Central Valley is, in a way, you know, that's where Sigma is there in the Central Coast, is sort of where, where the, the, the big action is. So um, thinking about ways to manage water in the basins that might not be completely in deficit right now, but, but that are going to be providing water maybe as part of the as part of the water quality control plan and or and or voluntary agreements um, sigma factors into that too because it's sort of part of the part of the overall equation and I, I I am certainly not meaning to suggest that therefore we shouldn't be talking about the the, the water solutions for for fish but I know this is something that's on a lot of people's minds of sort of how do we factor that in and and you know have smart policy about this and that could be things related to recharge and supporting more recharge in the wetter years. Could be things related to infrastructure. Um, Susan, you had a, a, one of your early blog posts as chair was about you know, thinking about the fact that the Delta Reform Act was also passed before Sigma mm -hmm. came into play. So I'd just love to get thoughts from each of you on sort of where you think the state can be helpful in what is also really a, a, another kind of cooperative process at the local level, uh, um, similar in some ways to the voluntary agreements, but, but locally of, of, of folks trying to figure out how to put this together. So I don't know, maybe I'll look to Susan first uh, for a thought on, on this. Um, yeah, so this, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is, is um, going to be a driver in a number of areas. One of them is uh, flows, and which, of course, we were talking about the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan and the voluntary agreements. And what strikes me is that when the plans, when the first plans under Sigma are submitted in January 2020, I, th I think that we're going to learn a lot about um, not only groundwater use and hydrology, but the entire system. And the, the difficulty for me is that the management actions in the sustainable groundwater management plans, um, until I see them, I don't know the full effect of uh, that, that that, for example, Floodmar, managed aquifer recharge, would have on flows. Um, we don't have right now a common accounting system for water budgets. We have, um, we're, we have urban water management plans, we have ag water management plans, now we have groundwater man sustainable groundwater management plans. Um, there's a, a uh, policy in the, the Delta plan that calls for reduced reliance and regional self-reliance, meaning agencies are to reduce reliance on exports from the Delta. Well, if you have Sigma calling for reduction in pumping and you have reduced reliance policy calling for decreases in Delta exports, the pie is definitely getting smaller unless, of course, we continue to make the improvements we have been making in water conservation and reuse and recycling. I, I don't think that 
but I can't say because I, I haven't seen the science and I don't know and I haven't seen the numbers, but I'm imagining that we, that water conservation and reuse and recycling are not going to make up the difference um, given sigma and reduced reliance call, uh, requirements. Um, hate to be such a downer. Yeah, Didi, yeah. Didi I know you have <laughs> yes. thoughts so, on this too. Well, first of all, thank you for the question. And I think that the most important thing is that we recognize that we don't have groundwater over here and surface water over there and the interconnection between the two. And that is something that Sigma calls for, looking at the interconnectivity. But as these plans are going forward, you know, to be implemented over, you know, a 20 year horizon, as we develop our water quality control plan and manage our surface water supplies with the understanding that things are going to change anyway, whether it's regulatory, whether it's through the water quality control plan, biological opinions, climate change, things are changing anyway. And so we absolutely, as we look at management of surface water, we need to be considering groundwater. And the one area that um, really disappointed me in a traditional approach. Again, not to oversell the voluntary agreements because we're not going to take just any voluntary agreement. It, it, you know, it has to be a solid agreement that uh, provides protection uh, to the fisheries. But um, one of the advantages, I think, of the voluntary agreement approach is that uh, we have the ability to, um, it, it is about flow, but it's about functional flow in that approach. And under a traditional approach, um, the options that we had before us on an unimpaired flow approach did have impacts. Some of those impacts would be transferred to groundwater. And uh, our staff report uh, in the phase one, we didn't, you know, I, I don't know about phase two yet, but in the phase one, just looking at portions of the San Joaquin Valley, um, it would have redirected impacts to groundwater, uh, depending on year type, somewhere between 100,000 and about 480,000 acre feet, which is a significant amount of water, um, putting it onto the groundwater sustainability plans that they are already going to have to undergo. Um, also an impact uh, because these systems are operated under a conjunctive use um, uh, with um, excess water going into the groundwater. Um, our staff estimated that the phase one uh, document uh, that we that our board approved could have an impact, an annual impact on a reduction of groundwater recharge by between 100 and about 180,000 acre feet. So we're talking about significant numbers here. So um, I do think that, um, again, the beauty of these voluntary agreements is can we um, incorporate a flow regime that's more strategic, you know, based on these functional flows so that uh, we can con provide for um, um, uh, the uh, reasonable protection of all beneficial uses. So uh, DWR has, um, so we are the implementer of the Sustainable Groundwater Management uh, Act and we will be in receipt of all those plans starting January 31st. Uh, but we also serve other important functions um, uh, that I think are ultimately part of the, the solution set. And um, I'm going to kind of lay this out in a more conceptual way, um, not in a regulatory way. Uh, but Department of Water Resources um, is uh, a primary flood manager in the Central Valley. So we have what's called the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan. And um, we, by law, need to update that every five years, and um, strangely enough, we actually do that. Um, that happens on a five-year interval, and then two years later, we actually update the California Water Plan, which is also on a five-year interval. So what we really need to do as a department is start to sync up those efforts, really start to integrate what we're trying to do in uh, the flood protection and, and management of floodwaters with the California Water Plan. 
And there's a couple of ways in which this, these ideas are starting to kind of you know, bubble up everywhere. We have like spontaneity of you know, emerging ideas about how to integrate, depending on where you are in the system. So one of the things that uh, I'm really proud of is some uh, early pilot work that the department is doing on both the Tuolumne and the Merced, where we're looking at these broader climate models and working with local agency partners to start getting into finer, kind of finer grain kind of information and understanding from the top of the watershed you know, essentially down to the delta, um, and if you're San Francisco, all the way out to San Francisco, um, to start understanding um, the ways in which we can manage those watersheds for multiple benefits across multiple risks. And that really does bring in some opportunities for flood management, for groundwater recharge, for physical restoration, uh, floodplain habitat restoration in those watersheds that I think are really exciting and can be aided with, I, I think even what we're starting to learn is even right now, without investing in any infrastructure, just management changes, there's some real opportunity to, uh, to capture water when it's wet and, um, and put it to use so that we have it for when it's dry. And that, that can relieve pressure all throughout the system. And that's important for everybody to understand and acknowledge. Um, other places where um, we're, we're, there's increasing traction around this uh, you know, flood water supply interface is what's called forecast informed reservoir operations. And Yuba County Water Agency is a big leader in this. And um, uh, the Yuba system is uh, DWR's partner in flood management when we operate Oroville. And there's a lot of good information about that we're developing. And in fact, I don't know if Sonoma County is, is here, but um, I, I think this is another lesson learned from the drought where we had some real issues in Lake Mendocino and kind of these crazy old ways of doing things uh, with the Corps of Engineers. And uh, in the context of the drought, uh, we worked with the Corps and they made some different decisions about how to manage that system. And that, um, those ideas have really caught fire in other places um, in ways that I think are, are really important and, and are part of our future. Um, and that's gonna, that is no question gonna involve a very intensive partnership with the federal government because of the role of the Corps of Engineers in helping us manage our flood curves in, uh, in these watersheds. Um, and that to me is another ex really exciting development on the Sacramento side of the system. Um, and then, you know, some of the uh, work that's starting to happen with Scripps Institute and DWR and uh, public water agencies uh, around uh, uh, atmospheric rivers and um, understanding them better and improving our predictive capabilities, uh, not only in terms of intensity, but in terms of uh, geography and landfall. And how do we bring that technology to bear to help us use existing infrastructure better um, and help us put flood flows either in the ground or uh, 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 well, in the ground, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but also, and also, of course, absolutely, you know, better protect life and property. Um, so, you know, it starts with, um, it starts with a plan, right, to kind of lay out the possibility. And um, uh, coming in as DWR director, I, I was, it was one of the things that surprised me um, the most is like, wow, we've got these two, you know, the, very significant water management functions in the Central Valley, and they don't talk to each other at the department. So they're now going to start talking to each other. And I think that's going to be helpful in identifying um, even some near-term solutions, but also help us prioritize the investment in physical infrastructure that will be required to make that happen. Um, I, uh, on the topic of physical infrastructure and aging infrastructure, um, and this whole mix of, of issues that we have and um, creating a better balance with the environment. I am an absolute firm believer in infrastructure has to play a more proactive role in helping to support the environment. Everybody knows we have a, a 
intensely altered system here in California. And the way we manage things now, which is every infrastructure project, you know, needs to sort out its mitigation and resolve its impact on species is, to me, it's an old way of, of thinking about the world and it's not gonna serve us into the future. And so we really need to think about infrastructure as an environmental asset. And I think that's going to be part of, uh, part of the mix moving forward. So let's see. I want to give us time for the audience to ask a few questions. Um, and while you think of your questions, um, I want to ask you each a sort of a quick lightning round. Um, and the theme of this conference is partnerships. So we've heard some good, good things about that already in, you know, in, this, in this complex watershed. Um, if you could, they, I didn't ask them to prep this, so this is putting them on the spot. Um, one, we, none of us believe in silver bullets, but one thing that you would most, uh, are most excited or, uh, about your agency bringing to the table and one thing that you most want to see from somebody else out there, or the collective else out there, uh, in terms of getting us to, to a better place on the Delta. Who wants to go first? <laughs> uh, I'll go first. I would like to acknowledge Michael George, our Delta Water Master, and um, I think he's done, speaking of partnerships, he spends a lot of time, boots on the ground, in the Delta, and I'm really excited about um, some partnerships that developed. Uh, we had a lot of challenges during the drought, with curtailment in particular, but one of the bright spots was some of the work that Michael did and others um, in the Delta, uh, to develop and encourage the development of a voluntary agreement in the Delta for a cutback of uh, roughly 25% of their consumptive use. And um, I am hoping that um, should we see another drought, and will we see another drought, yes, that, we can, that agreement can be renewed and built upon. And there is also some additional good work that uh, Michael is doing in the Delta. I know you had wanted to ask about data, so I'm going to just kind of plug this in. Um, I think we're going to be in a much better position in the next drought because of SB 88 and uh, uh, that requires measuring um, and reporting of diversions. And um, Michael has been working with um, many of the entities in the Delta where that's a little more challenging uh, to measure. And so uh, utilizing um, science and satellite um, uh, technology in order to um, hopefully come forth with agreements on how we can measure um, what's going on um, in an improved way in the Delta. So hoping to build on that. Great, and thank you, Michael. Carla. Uh, so I think two places, one um, in the Delta, local governments, reclamation districts, counties are, especially when it comes to physical restoration in the Delta, are, um, are absolutely our partners in um, getting that work done. And, um, and uh, you know, I think there's been some traditional relationships established over the years and kind of a, a pretty typical tension between local government and state government, but you know, for, for those local governments that are out there, um, you know, it's critical that uh, the Department of Water Resources understand needs more clearly um, and understand what we need to put in place to enable um, physical habitat in the Delta to uh, be successful and be respectful of local land use uh, in the Delta. Um, Another key piece of that partnership is integrating the flood aspect of it also in the Delta. We've got a pretty exciting project called Lookout Slough, which brings some bond dollars from flood money together with state water project dollars uh, that are needed for mitigation for uh, and creation of physical habitat. And those are the kinds of projects that they're gonna live or die on partnerships and our ability to define uh, multiple benefits and um, our ability to um, identify our solution set as um, a solution set that also provides for others. Um, so that's gonna be essential in the Delta. I also think uh, another uh, partnership that will have a, um, ultimately make the Delta and, and the watersheds um, 
uh, more sustainable in the future is, is what we're doing in the upper watershed. And um, one of the things I was just talking to, uh, to Brent Hasty earlier today about some of the good work the Yuba County folks are doing uh, with forest management. And I think that um, that, that kind of partnership uh, between local agencies and state um, to um, invest in forest management in ways that improve water quality and water supply is something that we also can't ignore. So when you start to look at um, something that's a little bit more expansive in terms of watershed management, um, to me it, it just really lays out uh, the fact that we have to start thinking across resource areas and across uh, you know, state, local, federal government um, to get uh, the kind of outcomes that we want um, relative to water supply reliability, relative to protecting life and, and property from flood, and, uh, and better environmental outcomes. Susan, lightning round. A lightning round partnerships, um, ecosystem restoration partnerships. The, the Delta Stewardship Council is in the midst of amending its ecosystem chapter. And one of the things I noticed that the most effective ecosystem restoration projects involve uh, local folks, reclamation districts, uh, the Bureau of Land Management, federal agencies, state agencies, the public-private nonprofit NGO partnerships. Um, to give you an example, on the Kasumnas River Preserve uh, or the Yolo Bypass, are really important. They take a lot of time, um, a lot of effort, a lot of outreach. The partners are not always in tune with each other. It, it could take maybe a decade. But things that are worthwhile do take time, and we absolutely have to have those partnerships. The, you asked about something I would like somebody out there to, to take care of. <laughs> is. Um, the funding for these partnerships, the creative funding, our, our institutional silos have our institutional programs and certain dollars have to go to floods, certain dollars go to ecosystems, certain dollars go to water supply. Um, the more we do multi -ben multiple benefit projects, we're gonna have to get creative about our funding pots, <coughs> maybe create a different kind of funding pot that is more uh, program or project based because more and more programs are, and projects are, are no longer just flood or just ecosystem or just groundwater. So Great. send Great. your money now. Thank you. Mm -hmm.